In January 3rd, 2008, a user found a bug in the Roblox system which compromised two Roblox users by the names of JJJ and Lego. This event left both accounts terminated forever. Keep in mind that this glitch has been patched long ago and has not affected anyone to this day. The games tab in Roblox back in 2008 consisted of many different games. Unlike today, the games tab changed its games daily. So finding a new game to play was not a hard task. However, in January 3rd, 8, the games tab showed a very strange game that caught many users' attention. This game was called Confusion, with a thumbnail which appears to take place underground. Underground battle games were a Roblox trend back then, so people were more than happy to see another one show up in the front page. The creator of the game was a user named W. A user with only one character. No one knew how he got such a name. The account was created in 2006, which led many users to believe he found a glitch in the system, when Roblox was not a very secure website. A couple people in the forums talked about this strange occurrence, where some people believed that this was a glitch, some believed it was a hack, and some thought he used spaces in his name when spaces were still available. A Roblox moderator known as Wookum said I and a couple moderators will look into this occurrence, he said in a temporarily pinned forum post. The game itself appeared nothing too complex, simply built mountains and white spheres spanned everywhere. Many people in the game talked mainly about the creator W, and didn't explore the game that much. One user named JJJ decided to check around the game. He said in a forum post after the incident I decided to kick around the balls, cause why not? One of the balls had a darkish grey tone, standing out from all the white balls. So I decided to kick that one, and that's when it started going downhill. When he touched the ball, he was teleported to a black box, with a lighting script that went off every couple seconds. Nothing new, this was a common script used in horror games back then. In the corner, there was a brown, glowing rectangle. It was about two studs high, two studs wide, and one stud thick, JJJ explained in his forum post. Like any Robloxon would do, he walked towards the box. But before he could touch it, the game froze, which forced him to restart his computer. But after the restart, his computer became slower and slower, until it wasn't functional. Another user named Lego experienced the same thing a couple hours after JJJ. Lego was not an uncommon face in the Roblox forums. He was known for ranting on the forums, mainly about people who spawn killed slash team killed in his favorite games. When Lego joined the game, he at first talked about how the game was a lie and wasn't a cool game, but he later decided to walk around and check the game out, and well, the same thing happened to Lego, as what happened to JJJ. About two hours after Lego joined the strange looking game, the game was shut down, and W's username was changed with a content deleted. However, W was not banned. He was online for the most part, and even replied to a couple forum posts from people who talked about this strange event. At around 9.30pm, Lego's avatar was changed to look like JJJ's avatar. Then both users posted many forum posts with titles like Roblox is doomed and Escape is no more. In January 4, 2008, the day after the incident, JJJ, Lego, and W were terminated. Many people believe that JJJ and Lego were compromised, while others believe that it was a massive prank resulting in terminations, due to the fact that this prank caused a lot of controversy. Many people, after the incident claimed they were also hacked because of this game, but most, if not all, these claims were fake. This unfortunate event eventually died down, as Roblox warned people that, if they talked about it, they would be banned. In February 2017, Lego's data was completely wiped from the site, and the username Lego has not been taken by another user. It is now 2021, and has been over 14 years since this event took place. Users can honestly say that Roblox has made a full recovery from this. Although it is unknown Lego and W returned to the site, JJJ returned about two months after the incident in an account called JJJ2, only to be temporarily terminated due to talking about this event. He was later terminated, but JJJ has not returned since.
In the early 1990s, a game for the DOS system was released by a developer named John Puckett. It went by the name Helios. The game was shareware and was not very well known. There was another game very similar to Helios known as Helios 2. Despite Helios 2 sounding like a sequel, it very much wasn't, and what John did was split the original Helios in two and sell the latter half as Helios 2 for 24.99 in USD. Oddly, both games work just fine for a Windows 32-bit system. Not much is known about Sean Puckett himself. The only thing known on him online is his very outdated company, Albino Frog Software, and his website. The company itself was originally known as Night Sky, before being inexplicably renamed to Albino Frog Software. The game, Helios, is... Odd. If a player were to start up the game, the first screen would be a text story about the backstory of the game. The backstory is as follows. Helios how to produce a game in 8 days. First off, I know you won't believe my story. That's alright. You don't have to believe it. I know it happened, and that's good enough for me. Besides, Helios is fun whether or not you believe how it came to be. I'm not the sort of person who likes UFO stories, and I used to scoff at them all. Whitley Strieber, now there's a nutcase, I'd think to myself. I used to watch Reject Blue Book when I was a kid, but that was just TV. I watched Star Trek, too. So on May 5th, 1993, UFOs were the farthest thing from my mind. But, of course, when you're least expecting it, boom, your life gets turned upside down. I usually get to bed around 3 in the morning. That night was a little stormy, unusual for Florida in May, especially 1993. A bit of lightning kicking off now and then, and the steady hiss of the rain, gurgle of the gutters, occasional car going past slinging yellow headlight beams through my bedroom window. I had just closed my eyes when a low, dull hum started up. Very faint, far away. We live near a small airport, so the throaty growl of a private plane is something we're used to and rarely take notice of. Even the eerie drone of the blimps also, moored nearby is common enough not to warrant a look. But this was unusual. Private planes, as a rule of thumb, don't fly during storms or at 3 in the morning. The blimps were certainly well tied down against the gusty wind. So what was this noise, this hum, that was growing louder? Police helicopter, maybe. They always seem to conduct late-night reconnaissance missions in my neighborhood just when I'm dropping off to sleep. Mayor's dog has probably gotten loose again. The light flicking in my windows seem to confirm this. A strong seared light beam apparently taking inventory of my front yard. Nothing there, fellas. No dogs, no escaped convicts. It was at this point that fear struck me. The light, I just realized it was green. The most brilliant green I had ever seen. No headlight was ever that color. No circ light would ever be green and so steady. The hum, having gradually gotten louder over the past minute, seemed constant in volume now, but the tone was changing. Instead of its initial droning pitch, it seemed to be modulating, varying in pitch slightly. There I was, standing near my window, bathed in bright green light, listening to an otherworldly hum coming apparently from right overhead. What would you do? I'll tell you what I did. I ran like a man possessed, nearly killing myself tripping over a stack of phone books in my mad rush to get to the other side of the house to the door outside, to safety. No way am I going to be trapped in this house with who knows what weirdness, be it spaceman, the CIA, or maybe the Illuminati. I flung open the door, and outside, where the garbage can should have been, was a bright shaft of greenish light. Standing in the light, swathed in mist, was a perfect copy of myself with its hand outstretched as if to open the door to get out. In the movies, the hero would now do a Groucho Marx routine and see if the image moved the same way he did, then he would make friends, learn a new alien language, draw up a treaty, all that stuff. I instead fainted and fell flat on my face into the weeds. My last thought was, there go the movie rights. I don't know how long I was out, whoever does. But it was dark when I woke up. No green light, no mirror image, no burbling hum. The door was still open. The garbage cans were back where they belonged. The rain had lessened to a light drizzle. The full moon was peeking through the thinning clouds. I stumbled around the soggy yard in a daze. 
I had a vague suspicion that there would be some sort of alien thing waiting for me in the house, so I didn't really want to go back inside. But the eventual realization that I was wandering around my front yard in the wee hours of the morning under a full moon with only my skivvies on made a certain impression on me, so rather than make a big scene waking the neighbors up and trying to sound less like a deranged lunatic, which I probably was, and more like a damp, frightened victim of UFO harassment in his skivvies, I peered in all the windows looking for suspicious green glows. I didn't see anything strange inside, so I crept back to the door and made my way in, slowly, listening, carefully. I fired up all the lights at once, with a light control system. Nothing amiss. Checked the closets, no alien ambassadors. Looked in the shower, no mutants. Opened all the kitchen cabinets, no extraterrestrial slime molds, no super space roaches, nothing. Everywhere I looked, zip. I was beginning to relax. Checked the computer room, turned on the computers, made sure all the drives were okay. Perfect. The data, my latest projects, were safe. Much more relaxed now, delayed stress syndrome, kicked in and I got a sudden, incredible case of the shakes. My heart started to pound, my knees got all weak, and I sank into the chair. And instantly right out of it I leaped, like an 800 volt cat. I always leave my chair, tucked under the desk, but it had been in the middle of the room when I came in. I grabbed up the nearest blunt object, my VCR remote, and scanned the room intently. I don't know what I planned to do with the remote, but there it was, and whatever happened to me, I wanted to die with a weapon in my hand. I kicked the chair away, and it whirled into a corner. I stood still for many moments, listening, looking. But nothing moved, nothing happened. The bright eye of my computer monitor patiently glared at me, almost seeming to say, what are you up to? I wearily wandered over to the cabinets and, hooking my foot under the door, opened each one. Junk, just like I left it. The shelves of books appeared to be undisturbed. My desk drawers I opened with a back scratcher at three paces. A mismatch of printouts and faxes. Nothing. Looked under the desk. Just bunnies. Hell. I felt like an idiot. All this paranoia, because I left my chair out for once in my life. I sat heavily into it and wheeled up to the computer keyboard. In the cracks between the keys were traces of green fluid. On the disk drive handle, more. I bolted to my feet once more and searched the whole house again with a flashlight, this time checking each and every cranny. Nothing, nowhere. Just traces of green slime on the keyboard and the disk drive. Okay. So this UFO roared up to my house at 3 in the morning in the middle of a thunderstorm, scares me till I faint, and the only evidence I have of it is some rapidly evaporating green blob on my computer. And... What's this? A new directory on the hard drive. A collection of files in it. Right. Sure. Aliens brought me some files. Probably interstellar shareware, right? I copied the files onto a disk deleted them from the hard drive, and did a complete systems check, virus check, disk integrity check, everything. Nothing was wrong. I go over to the testing machine, and punch up the files on the disk. No README. Why am I not surprised? But there is a bunch of source files, and one EXE file. I don't mind running strange things on the test machine, that's what it's for. So I fire it up. What I got then is very similar to what you now have before you in Helios. An incredibly strange, surreal game. No scoring, no words, just some weird symbols. I showed it to some friends and told them where I got it. They quite disbelieved my story, but they did like the game and had never seen it, or anything like it, before. Someone suggested I upload it to a board, so I decided to, but not until I tacked on the title screen in some good old-fashioned American entrepreneurial spirit. I divided the game into two segments, and now you have the first half. And that's how you got your copy of Helios. I made up the name on the title screen. It's a Van Gogh, of course, and seemed appropriate. When the player would continue, the next screen would be of a tentacle made of decreasingly smaller science spheres on top of an interlaced web of something gray. Surrounding the tentacle would be a color wheel made of spheres in a polygonal pattern of nine colors, red, orange, yellow, light green, dark green, cyan, blue, purple and pink. Surrounding the spheres would be nine inexplicable symbols, each to their respective color sphere. 
Each symbol is different, making a total of nine different symbols. In the background of the spheres would be descending rings, almost like a surface mine. The player would control the tentacle, moving it around as if the biggest science sphere were pinned to the web. If the player moves the tip of the tentacle in the directions of one of the colored spheres with a mouse, if the player clicks in the direction of the spheres, the symbol near the sphere changes, turning into the symbol of the sphere to the clockwise direction of it. It turns out that this menu is actually a screen to enter a code, the spheres themselves being a level select. To unlock the web of spheres, you must play the game. To select the level, the player must point the tentacle toward one of the colored spheres and hit enter. The screen would then change to that of one centered on an almost balloon-like sphere. The player would then use the arrow keys to propel the balloon forward. The method of propulsion is almost as if it's a rocket in space. The balloon blows out some sort of white gas to push it. The physics are very much like space as well, using the laws of inertia, meaning that if you propel the ball forward, then it won't stop until it hits something, and in fact, then it only just bounces off of it. Each level is different. Some are simple mazes. Others are areas filled with enemies that either stick to the wall and shoot some sort of object at you, or are things that float around and target you. One thing that is similar between these levels however is the extreme tiling, as in the same object or background is repeated again and again. These tiles make up the walls and floors of the level. The objective of the game is to go around each level and collect some sort of blue gems. When the player collects all of the gems, a small flag with a level symbol appears. The player then moves over to the flag, and when they go over it with a balloon, it turns it into one of the symbols from the main menu. This symbol is part of the sequence on the web of spheres, and when you enter it into its colored sphere, and the rest from the completed levels, the final screen appears. And well, the screen is indescribable, so the only way this can be shown is through a photo format. The screen isn't still. Usually a small, almost sinister sounding alien drone sounds through the background while the small cyan balls float toward the center. This is Helios. No one knows whether aliens actually made this game or not. No one knows what any of this is supposed to mean. The only person who has a clue about the game is Sean Puckett, but no one knows this guy, or even if he still exists. Any way of contacting him is extremely out of date, whether through the game's addresses or the Albino Frog's outdated website. However there is one question. Are we alone? When I was a child, one of my favorite games was The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Anyone who's played it can probably figure out why, even if they don't particularly find it their favorite. Naturally, as a very popular game, it spawned a lot of rumors and legends, especially back in the day when communication through the internet wasn't as common. Most of these legends are false, but sometimes a surprising amount of truth can be found in them. A while ago, I had read an article about early versions of Zelda 3D, as it was called in development, and apparently these early versions were incredibly different from the release version. It was modeled after the original Legend of Zelda rather than a link to the past, and as such was a lot more free-roaming and adventurous than the one we got. At the time, it sounded awesome, and I even found myself wondering why they had abandoned the project. I concluded that it was probably due to the technical requirements of such a feat. Still, one thing that especially stuck with me were the pictures. Some were nondescript, nothing special, but one showed a large expansive desert environment. There was a palm tree and a small oasis, near a much more primitive looking link, as well as some enemies. Past that, however, was just sand, stretching to the horizon. The thoughts of what might lay beyond that desert, seemed to stick the image to my mind. After that we skipped several years. The article was only a vague recollection, nothing important. I was hanging out at the local game shop, with one of my friends. He's telling me about his day, and tells me how some guy came to sell his missing son's old video games. He showed me them and they were all normal games. A few Wii games, a few Gamma games, and a lot of Nintendo 64 games. Still, the only one that really caught my eye was a red cartridge with no label except a piece of tape with the word ZELDA written over it in marker. Naturally, this got me curious. 
My friend didn't share my curiosity, but he didn't think he could sell the game and just let me take it home for free and indulge myself. Naturally, I did. The moment the game started, I realized it wasn't the Zelda I was used to. The title screen was nothing but a nondescript, The Legend of Zelda. No subtitles, no fancy font, no music, just those words in black bordered lettering. The background wasn't from Ud or MM either. It was an overhead view of what could only be called ancient ruins. They looked very sinister and grotesque, similar to something from Majora's Mask, only without any hint of the mystical atmosphere that accompanied any Zelda game. They were simply unnerving. Still, this didn't stop my curiosity, it only kept me going. As soon as I press start, the game begins. It skips over any file screens and dumps a blocky looking link into an empty black environment. And when I say black, I mean black. There was nothing separating ground and sky. Just blackness. The only thing that let me notice that the game even worked was a temple in the distance, similar to the one in the opening. Moving still seemed to work fine, suggesting that something probably glitched with the textures of the ground and sky. Still, it seemed strange that nothing happened to any other textures. Entering the temple was my only choice, so I took it. One thing that is worth mentioning is that the game started with no music, just deathly silence. However, the closer you came to the temple, the more music was available to hear. Well, it wasn't really music. It sounded like moaning, similar to the Redev Zenut, but more tinny and badly recorded. Every once in a while some sobs could be heard, but they were quickly stifled. Entering the temple made everything seem more like a Zelda game, but something caught my eye. Rather than the textures being worse than those in Oot, they were better. There was more detail in everything, but it was all dingy and rotten looking. Extra polygons only served to make things look more grotesque. The random blood splatters didn't help anything, either. It didn't take long for me to realize that the entire dungeon could hardly be called Zelda-like. Puzzles usually only consisted of pulling a lever or pressing a switch. In fact, there weren't even any sliding blocks. There were no enemies, either, but the blood splatters on the wall soon served to be warnings of booby traps. Some become inescapable and simply send you back into the darkness again. Others are escapable, but still extremely creepy and... Depressing. The dungeon was riddled with a low poly remains of dead adventurers, and sometimes they even had items on them. The items could be picked up, but the inventory screen seemed unfinished, and the game only auto equipped the first three items picked up since there was no accessible inventory screen. After several gruesome deaths and retries, I find my way to a door marked with a scratched on eye, similar to the ones on the lens of truth and various other objects. Entering this door revealed a boss battle. The music by this point had changed, and I only realized it by the last room. The moaning had never looped once, but still seemed to change according to the mood. A discordant violin melody started playing, but the rest of the sound remained nothing but moans, sobs, yells, and weird scratching. It was never enough to rise past the level of background noise, but it still remained unnerving, almost as if it wasn't music at all, but monsters that were wandering somewhere in the temple. When I said entering the room revealed a boss battle, I was not entirely honest. It could only be called a boss battle by the most generous standards. It featured an empty room with the same textures on the walls as the rest of the temple. The only out-of-place aspect was a giant face on the other side of the room, colored as gray as the walls surrounding it. Its skin seemed stretched over its head and lined with a wall, so it looked as if the wall was growing a face. Moss seemed to be growing over its closed eyes, and cracks were apparent everywhere on it. Still, the door I came in was locked, and the only thing to do was approach. I did so, carefully, making sure nothing was waiting for a surprise attack. I went up to the point where I was nearly in contact with a face. Nothing. It was still there, with its sunken eyes and cracked lips. I attacked it with my sword. The sword went through, and made an incredibly vulgar flesh ripping sound, but nothing happened. It remained there. I attacked some more, and still more, until eventually the music stopped. Soon the cacophony of violin music became even louder and the moans started up even stronger, and then something happened. In one movement, its eyes opened, staring at me with dry, soulless sidewalls. And then... Nothing. The music was still louder, but I continued to attack the face with no reaction until it simply had enough ripped to shreds and fell away in the fire in typical Zelda fashion, revealing a door. The music had stopped. There were no more moans, screams, anything. I went through the door. What a fool I was. That was only the tutorial. The screen was replaced by a white screen, followed by a moment of extremely loud brownie and noise. I jumped, but it was over almost instantly. The white screen was replaced by endless dessert. The one from the image. I was in shock. 
by that point, I was creeped out enough to turn the game off. Still, that respite didn't last long, I had nightmares of the game. Normal nightmares, nothing weird about them, it was, after all, a pretty creepy game. However, what frightened me the most was something I skimmed over while I played and realized afterwards. The game changed each time I started over. When I tried to take the same path through the labyrinth, I always ended up lost and confused. By the time I finished, I was relying on instinct. I kept going the next day, stopping only to even go to the bathroom. When I turned it on, I was still at the desert, even though there was no file screen. This time it was night, I walked. Sometimes I would walk for 20 minutes only to find the half sunken obelisk or the ruins of what looked like some village hut. Other times there would be a skull or a few bones, but nothing more noticeable than that. Other times I would see great expanses of oasis and tropical forests. I found my first enemies here. They were similar to tektites, only with larger bodies, mostly containing their large eye. They had thin, long legs and would still attack by leaping. Only when they hit you, they would pin you to the ground and attack. Soon the sun rose, and I continued walking. Sometimes I would find small tombs. These were almost always similar, in style to the first dungeon, only without the moaning and no bosses. What I did find was information. Runes scribbled onto the walls, that could be read. The description would almost always be vague, with phrases like A knowledge show guide Way to hands Sometimes they would be followed by other comments, but most writing seemed glitched and unintelligible. It seemed to be a history, though. The maps I sometimes found confirmed it. I simply explored, and after a while, I learned to let instinct guide my way. Soon I found the next dungeon, a large pyramid rising out of the desert. Upside down. Over it, straight up to the sky, was another large upside down temple. It stretched so far I couldn't see the top. But I couldn't keep going. I needed sleep again. The next day came, and I entered the dungeon. It was like all the small tombs I would find, only a bit more perilous. More bottomless pits. Chasms, spike traps, and monsters this time. Long arms that would grab you from out of the wall like wall masters, only they simply threw you into the traps, killing you. What probably used to be redeads and skeletons. At the end of this dungeon, I found a large spiral staircase. I followed it up and up until I reached what seemed to be the top. It took two hours of climbing, but the time seemed to fly by. The top was merely a platform with a large, ornate arrow pointing off an edge. Since there was nowhere else to go, I jumped. The screen again flashed white, and I was in the new area. This went on for the next few weeks. There were many places to visit, and at times I could find the borders where one locale met another. I started to name the locations I had been to, but although I started knowing all the places intimately, there never seemed to be an end to new locations. Sometimes I would go through one door and come out on the other side of the world. Places didn't behave like constant rules of space, but it became easier to find my way regardless. Each time I revisited a place, it was rearranged in a different, more navigable setup. From every corner though, I could see the tower in the distance. I quickly realized that I had not reached the top, only falling into one of many traps. In fact, I still have not reached the top. In the few times I went about the real world, I could feel that the game was different. It changed itself. It seemed to react to me. I was sure that a game like this should not have been able to be created. But then, they were going for a free roaming experience more similar to the original Zelda. What if they succeeded? They created a world one could always roam. And they really did create a world. I had learned of many gods in that land. The three goddesses who had created such a perverted physical world. The god he who sees, who decided to cleanse it. I still don't know my own route, but I felt that if I simply followed my instincts, I could find my goal. That's why I'm writing this now. My instincts still tell me where to go. But it's not here. It's not in the game. I have to leave, and I will do it. But before I go, I feel I have to leave this message for someone to find. I should warn you though, it may be a game, but it knows you are playing. Some people might recall the momentary buzz caused in 2009 by a particularly odd Moron mod. The file name was JVK1166ZS. It was never posted on any of the larger Elder Scrolls communities, only smaller hordes and role-playing groups. I know in a few cases, rather than being posted, it was sent via PM or email to a chosen few. It was only up for a few days, to the best of my knowledge. 
It caused a buzz because it was a virus or seemed to be. If you tried to load the game with a mod active, it would hang at the initial load screen for a full hour and then crash to the desktop. If you let it get that far, your install of Warroad, along with any save files you had, would become completely corrupted. Nobody could figure out what the mod was trying to do since it couldn't be opened in the construction set. Eventually, warnings were distributed not to use it if you found it, and things died down. About a year later, in a mod board I used to frequent, someone popped up with a mod again. He said he was beat by a lurker who deleted his account immediately after sending. He also said that the person advised him to try playing the mod through DOSBox. For some reason, this worked. Sort of. The game was a bit laggy, and you couldn't get into options, load game, the console, or really anything else other than the game itself. The quick of and quick load hot buttons worked, but that was it. And the quick of file seemed to be just part of the game file, so you couldn't get at it anymore. Some speculated that the change game used an older graphics render, making DOSBox necessary, but it didn't look any different. This part I can speak about from personal experience. When you start a new game in JVK, as the board came to call it, once you leave the starting bit in the census office and come into the game proper, the first thing you notice is that the prophecy has been severed box tops up. This is because every single NPC having to do with a main quest is dead, with the sole exception of Yagram Bagern, the last of the Dreamer. Their corpses never despawn, so you can go check on all of them. In effect, you begin in a world that is doomed to start with. The second thing you notice is that you're losing health. It's only a bit, but it keeps happening a little bit at a time. The longer you stay in one place, the quicker it seems to occur. If you let this health loss kill you, you'll find the cause, a figure we came to call the Assassin, because he seems to wear a retextured version of the Dark Brotherhood armor from Tribunal, even though the expansions don't work in JVK. It's all black, completely untextured, like he's just a hole in space. The way he moves. He gave me quite a start, the first time I saw him scuttling around my dead body. He crawls inhumanly on his hands and feet, his arms and legs splayed out like a spider. You'd usually only see him after death, crawling around and over your body just before the reload box popped up. Occasionally, you could catch a glimpse of him darting around the corner or crawling on the wall or ceiling. It made the game very difficult to play in the dark. Other than that, the only noticeable difference is that at night, at random intervals, every NPC in the game will go outside for a few minutes. During this time, the only thing they will say when hailed is, watch the sky. Once they return to their normal behavior, they act regularly, though. After a while, a player on the board discovered a new NPC named Tyeras, a male Dunmer, in the temple at Ghost Gate. Two things are notable about this NPC. First is his robe, a unique article of clothing that was lovingly rendered with twinkling stars all across it, looking like a torn off chunk of the night sky. The second is that all of his dialogue, in addition to showing up in the dialogue box, is voiced. You can skip it if you wish, but it all sounds like it's in the default male Dunmer voice. Some people said that they thought the voice was slightly different, but it was a very, very good imitation. I won't go into the details, but the questline he sends you on has to do with a dungeon, referred to simply as the Citadel. Up until this point, the quests were all of a fairly generic, discover the secrets of the ancients type. The entrance to this dungeon is on a small island far to the west of Moron proper. I eventually discovered that if you use the scroll of a carry and flight at the westernmost point on the main landmass and jump directly west, you'd end up almost exactly at the island. Even though the dungeon is called the Citadel, it goes straight down. It dwarfs any other dungeon, both in size and difficulty. From a natural cave area you'll proceed down into an ancestral tomb looking area, then a Daedric rune area, and then a Dreamer rune area. I made it down to the Dreamer runes before I quit. The creatures here were so strong that a level 20 character would have to take care, and since you can't use the console in JVK, level 20 took a while to get to. Since quick sub and quick load are your only options, it's all too easy to get yourself into an impossible situation, too. I did, and I just didn't have the energy to start over. What I'm telling you now is based on the testimony of those few who went further. Past the Dreamer Runes, you apparently find yourself in a level like the Dreamer Runes, but darker. 
Rather than the usual bronze, all the surfaces, including those of the creatures, are black. The sounds of machinery are loud here, and grow louder still, randomly. There's also steam or sock everywhere, limiting your vision to about 10 in-game feet or so. If you can make it through all this, you will reach a room at the end of the hall. Those who found it called it the portrait room. Like the fire, in torches or other effects, from early 3D games, this room has picture frames that always face directly at you, no matter how you look at them. The images in the frames are always randomly chosen images from your My Pictures folder. On the board, the ones who got to this point had some fun posting screenshots of the portrait room with various pictures in the frames, usually p of course. At the end of the hall was another locked door. After admitting defeat and returning to Tyeras, he could be found saying, Watch the sky, in his gravelly voice. What's more, nobody else in the game would say anything. Talking to them would present a completely blank dialogue box, with no options at all. They wouldn't even rattle off the usual, canned audible greetings. The only exception was at night, whenever they go out for a few minutes, they'd repeat it. Watch the sky. At this point, one of the players a friend of mine from the board noticed, and the few others who got this far agreed that the night sky was no longer the usual night sky of Tanriel, it had changed to a depiction of a real night sky. And it moved. From this point on, everything is based on what this one person reported. Eventually, he got himself kicked from the board, but I kept in contact with him for as long as he responded. According to him, based on the constellations and planets, the sky started around February 2005. If you died, loaded, or went back into the Citadel, it would start over. When the usual day sky graphics took over, the movement would be suspended until the stars appeared again. In the space of a single night, everything would move about two months worth. Since the timescale of JVK was more or less that of the standard game, that meant that a bit less than an hour was equal to a 24-hour period. He became convinced that the door would open based on some kind of celestial event. Of course, waiting for that meant leaving the game running. Of course, that meant that the game couldn't be left unattended thanks to our old friend, the Assassin. My friend decided he'd hang out for a whole day just to see if anything happened. That would be about a year's worth of movement. Here's the post he made at the end of this experiment. I loaded in Satanine, where it all starts. It wasn't too bad, just had to check in now, and then to move around and heal to make sure I wasn't dying. But check it out. 24 hours exactly in, the assassin learns a new trick. He screams. I was reading, and all of a sudden, this crazy loud shriek just about makes me crap myself. It was like something out of a horror movie. I look up, and there he is, just crouched down right in front of me. Of course, the second I moved my character, he ran off. When I went back down to the portrait room, the door was still locked. Damn it, damn it, damn it. A bit later, he came to the decision that he needed to wait three days, three years. His reasoning was that the PM advising us to try DOSBox showed up in February of 2008. That was the point he needed to get to. After the first shriek, the assassin stops hitting you out of nowhere. Now he'll shriek, and if you don't move, for a few seconds after that, he hits you. I think whoever made the mod was trying to help. At night, I've got my headphones on, and I was just kind of dozing off when he wakes me up with a shriek. I jiggle the mouse, and I'm good. That post was two days in from his laptop. Once it was over, So f***ing done. So I wait for three days, right, and right after the f***ing assassin made me jiggle the mouse, he shrieks again. So I look, and everyone in town is outside. They're all saying, watch the sky. I don't see anything, though. But then the game starts getting dark. Like really dark. I turn the brightness all the way up on my monitor, and I can still barely see. There are other people in the game, little figures running around in the distance, just going back and forth. If I try to get close, they run off. Now, I was trying to sleep, so the lights were off, and this was kind of creepy. I didn't want to get up to turn on my light, because I didn't want to miss anything, but nothing f happens. Eventually, I go to the Citadel. It was still dark, and I had to swim, and the whole time I could see all these guys swimming all around me, just barely there. 
I make it to the Citadel and it's normal light inside, and I get worried. Sure enough, the portrait door is still f closed. I go outside and it's all starting over. So that's it. I'm going to bed, and I'm done. The end. After that, two things happened. First, someone else who got to the portrait room claimed that the assassin was showing up in his regular Moron game. Quick explanation, if you reinstalled Moron to a different folder, you could have a normal Moron install along with JVK. He himself chalked it up to an overactive imagination at first, but he reported a couple of really big scares, with a black figure crawling right at him, or seeing it waiting just around the corner before scuttling off. Another of those who reached the portrait room started a regular Moron game, but never saw him for sure. It was just a couple of maybes, late at night, and always at a distance. The second is that my friend started getting really abusive and short, tempered on the board, though he stopped talking about JVK entirely. It got so bad that he was soon kicked off. I didn't hear anything from him for a couple of weeks after that, so I sent him an email. This was part of his reply. I know I shouldn't have, but with classes out, I had some time, so I started JVK up again. It's almost 2011, and I think I've got the sleep madness. But stuff is happening. It's still dark. Once it gets dark, it never gets any lighter. It stays like that. The people moved a few months ago. Everyone in Sadamine just went to that little bandit cave and moved in. They killed the bandits inside, and now they're just standing around inside. They don't say anything anymore, they don't do anything when you click on them. I quicksilled and killed one, and he just stood there until he died without fighting back. And it's like that everywhere. You have to walk, since the quick travel people are all in caves now, too, but all the cities and towns are deserted, their people are in caves and tombs. Everyone in Vivek is down in the sewers. I'm going to Ghost Gate next. I want to see if Tyeras is still there. I'll tell you what he says when I get there. I replied and said I wanted to see what he said too, and waited a day. When I didn't get a reply, I mailed him again, and a couple of hours later, he sent back. Sorry, I totally forgot. So it's 2014 now. Since it's always night, the stars are always moving. The whole screen is dark, but you can still see the brightest stars moving around. Tyeras was gone. Everyone in Ghost Gate was gone. I don't know where they went. They're not in any of the nearby caves. But there's new stuff. People still don't say anything, but their eyes are bleeding. It's so dark that even with a light spell, you have to get right up against them to see. But there they are, little dark streaks coming down from their eyes. I think I gotta be getting close. I know this is stupid and there's no way the payoff is going to be worth it. But I just want to be able to say I stuck it out. I got that one during the day. Later that night, I received the follow-up email. Some of the planets aren't moving right. It's pissing me off. If this keeps up, I won't be able to keep track anymore. It's almost 2015 now, I think. You know, I just now noticed that there aren't any monsters anymore, either. I'm completely alone outside now. The main quest people's bodies are still lying around, though. I went to check on them. I don't need headphones anymore, so I just leave them off. When he shrieks, it's like he's screaming right into my ear. I think I even kind of anticipate it. He's around a lot more now, a lot closer. He's different from the other people who started showing up, remember? They keep running around where I can barely see them. I have to admit, it's kind of creepy at night. Sometimes, when I go to the bathroom or whatever, I swear I can see something out of the corner of my eye. I'm keeping all the lights on now. I sent him a letter, jokingly telling him to get some real sleep, and left it at that. Two mornings later, I found this in my email. It was the last thing I got from him. After it, he stopped responding completely. I just got up from a fucked up dream, I think. The assassin shrieked at me, and when I opened my eyes, he was right there, crouching over me. His arms and legs were longer, and more like a spider's. I tried to push him away, but when I touched him, my hands went inside, and I couldn't get them loose again, like he was made of power or something. Then I woke up. I thought he was gone, but when I looked at the monitor, I wasn't where I was. I was in the Corporatorium with Yagram. For once, the light was okay, and I could see him all bloated on those mechanical spider legs. 
I sat down at the computer and he started talking to me. Not in a box, but really talking to me in Tyera's voice. He knew things about me. He told me things that I never told anyone and some things I totally forgot about. He told me that almost nobody had made it this far and that the door would open up soon. I just had to hang on a little while longer. He said I'd know when it was time. He said I might be the first one to see what was inside. And then I woke up for real that I was at the computer. I still wasn't where I was. Right now, I'm swimming out to the Citadel Island. And I can hear this tapping. It's at my window. It's over on the left, so I'm sending you this because I left my laptop by my bed to the right. Just a little tap 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 tap. Like he's knocking his finger against the glass. I might still be dreaming now. I guess that's the end of the story. I know there are a few other tales floating around about this mod, but this is the only one I know as true as far as it goes. I deleted my JVK copy of the game pretty much right after I gave up, but I'd like to get the mod again if anyone still has a copy of the file. I want to see some of this for myself.